Now we have a great interview for you oh here on TYT News. Look at this, a living legend, how Larry thrilled, King. How thrilled you must be, aren't you? <laughs> I can say the things going through you now, right now, that I'm <laughs> sitting next to a living legend. <laughs> Larry, let me tell you a quick story. Uh, this is how my interviews start. Instead of you talking, I talk. Um, <laughs> one of my friends, once I got into the talk shows business, like 18 years ago, said, what are you, crazy? What are you going to be, Larry King? <laughs> <laughs> like, you could never be Larry King, oh, so you you got to be crazy nice, to try. Well, when you do something for 57 years, as Sinatra once said, uh, there's a lot to be said for longevity. If you hang around long enough, you must be doing something right. But I thank you for the compliment. Uh, no problem. So uh, now, of course, I, I want to get into your career and how you got here, the 57 years. First, I want to let everybody know what you're doing today. So you're on Oro TV. Uh, I'll tell you, get a little history. I, I left CNN. I thought I could retire. I was uh, 77 years old at the time. Uh, I have two young kids. They're playing Little League. They now play in high school. I wanted to watch them more. I wanted to spend more time. I had a good life, had a great career. And uh, I thought I could retire. I went down to Mexico City and did a charity event for Carlos Slim, the richest man in the world, a wonderful man. And I came back, had dinner at the house, he guessed it on my CNN show, and then in the course of time, I went down and opened his fantastic museum in Mexico City. We sailed on his boat in the Sea of Cortez, flew into Mexico City, and then in the course of discussion, he said, you, you can't retire, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know, and we were discussing, and my wife said, well, why not, why not a, a network on, on, on the internet? Mm -hmm. so, I know how that feels. So he financed it, and, uh, made me a, I'm a 20 percent partner he has 80 percent and we picked the name aura because that means now in italian or spanish mm -hmm. and we call the show larry king now and we got uh, hulu plus to distribute it hired a wonderful staff in new york and in los angeles started up and now we're putting other things on the network lots of other shows new ideas come along and it was july will be two years old and it's done very, very well, and the internet came along, and I'm still doing what I've always done. In other words, in 1957, I started in radio. I started interviewing people. I'm still doing that. I still love it. I still am inquisitive. I haven't lost my enthusiasm. The only thing that's changed is the method of distribution. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's you know, all. I've, uh, the, my world hasn't changed. The technical world around me has changed. When you said you were retiring, I thought there's no way in the world. Because you, you love it too much. Well, I really, I was kind of, it was a semi-forced retirement. Uh -huh. So the truth is, I had always signed at CNN three or four year contracts. And then in 20, 2009, they came to me and I, my contract was drawing to a close. And they offered me a one year contract. And I saw that as writing on the wall. Yeah. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one year through 2010. And, uh, but I'm going to announce that I'm leaving because I, I, I didn't want to hang around. If, if you're not wanted, you know. Right, right. And, uh, and then they were very fair to me. They gave me a three-year contract mm -hmm. and uh, paid me for not doing anything, allowed me to do anything. <laughs> I could do commercials. I could do anything. But I couldn't work for Fox, Fox News or MSNBC for those three years. Yeah, that makes sense. It's not a bad deal. I'd probably take that no, deal. No, I, I never had a bad moment at CNN. They were very, very nice to me. I would have liked to have done longer, but then again, there was a plus in retiring too. There was a lot of pluses. The thing I miss is uh, what really hit me was the night Osama bin Laden was killed. Mm -hmm. I was watching on television and Osama bin Laden's killed and I almost wanted to jump out of my chair and go somewhere and interview people about that. And there was nowhere to go. And right. You should have come here to the Young Turks. <laughs> the Young Turks. I could have gone any. I could have gone anywhere. But I, I, I wanted to host. I wanted to interview people. I wanted to, you know, when 9/11 occurred, we did I think 90 straight nights. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing like being in the middle of the hunt. Yeah, I love absolutely. That. There's something. Absolutely. It's, it's the action. So you also have another show, Politicking? I do Politicking. We signed up with the RT Network. Russian TV owns mm -hmm. that. They never interfere with us, by the way, mm -hmm. because we've criticized Putin a lot on <laughs> RT. Uh, but that RT, that was a deal we made through Aura TV. Mm -hmm. So at Aura TV, we have a program called Politicking, which is specifically designed for RT, but it's also broadcast on Aura TV and on Hulu, 
and RT also carries Larry King now. Mm -hmm. So we're on cable. And now we're on cable throughout Canada. Mm -hmm. And now we're in Europe. And now we're starting for South America. And politicking is an integral part of it. So I do an extra show every week dealing so, specifically with politics. So what is your politics? I got to ask. Republican, Democrat? Well, I have never announced it. So this is an excellent no, time I to would, do I so. tell you, I never, I've, never, <laughs> I've never on the air brought my politics to it. So I am liberal in areas, conservative in areas. I voted for Republicans. I voted for Democrats. But I never thought, so if you give me an issue, I'll give you an opinion on the issue. But I never thought that my opinion counted because the way I approached interviewing was that I left my ego at the door. Uh, the name, what Larry King thought about something really didn't matter. The, the guest mattered. I didn't know more about law than the lawyer. I didn't know more about medicine than the doctor. I didn't know more than my guest. And I respected the guest. I could have disagreed. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to be the conduit from me. And you, if you're not giving your opinion, the guest is more comfortable because you're more interested. In, they're not there in a confrontational set, and I'm there to learn. So we made, we made the front page of the New York Times, I think more than any other talk show ever, mm -hmm. because I was getting good quotes. I also uh, uh, won a Peabody for the radio, the only Peabody ever for, for a, a lifetime work on radio talk shows, where I never gave an opinion. Right. Now, when I did Open Phone America late at night, in those old days, I would give opinions on issues, on sports, on politics. So, if you have an issue, I'll be happy to. So, but let's say, no, I hear you on that. And I know that that's your style and that's important to you doing the interviews. Uh, but let's say I'm your doctor and I need to know, <laughs> okay. Uh, and I say, Larry, it's really important before I do the surgery, are you liberal, moderate, or conservative? Liberally moderate. Liberally moderate, okay. Fair enough. Okay, that's I'm good. not conservative. You're not conservative. Okay. Uh, so now let's go back to 1957, because this is the part I'm most interested in. Now, I had heard a story that, that uh, you would go to the uh, radio station every single day, knock on the door, and say, I, I want in. And they'd say, no, go away, no, go away. And then finally they brought you in. Is that true? I, went down, I went down to Miami. Uh -huh. uh, someone told me James Sermons was, I always want to be in radio. Mm -hmm since five years old. I have no other memory. I never want to be a fireman, doctor, policeman, nothing. I want to be in radio. I used to imitate radio shows. I'd listen to a show and then go into the bathroom and do The Shadow Knows, <laughs> a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I just wanted to be a radio announcer. It's all I want to be. And I did a bunch of odd jobs. I worked for UPS, I worked for Hearn's Department Store, and I didn't go to college, and my father had died when I was nine. And I just kicked around, and then my brother went through college and was graduating. He was going to graduate law school, and I was walking down the street in New York, and a friend said, "That's James Sermons, who was chief of announcers at CBS. His job was to hire announcers." So I went over to him. I said, "Mr. Sermons, I always wanted to be in radio. And do you have any advice?" He said, "Well, go down to Miami. If you got, if you can, go down to Miami. Go down to Miami. There's no union and a lot of stations. So there's a chance you might break in." So I took the train, went down to Miami. I had $13 in my pocket. My uncle had a little apartment on Miami Beach. I stayed with him. He was a widower. I knocked on doors. WIOD was the first station that threw me out. I later worked for them for 18 years. Uh, knocked on, and then finally went to a small station, WAHR. I'd never spoken in front of a microphone. Mm -hmm. They put me down and gave me a sheet of paper to read the news. I read the news. And the manager came in and says, You're, we like your voice. Listen, we have a big change over here. You know, we only pay $50, $55 a week. Uh, somebody always leaves. If you want to hang around and learn, we'll hire you to first opening. So I hung around that station literally for a month. I watched every day. I watched all the shows. I'd sit next to the disc jockeys, watch the newsmen, the sports. It was a small station. I just, I just wanted it so much. And then on a Friday, Marshall Simmons, the late Marshall Simmons, came in. It was late April. And he said, listen, uh, this guy just quit. And you start Monday. You're on from 9 to 12. You'll play music. And in the afternoon, you'll do news and sports. And you paid $55 a week. I was so excited. I went back to my uncle's house. I didn't sleep that whole weekend. I, my God, I was practicing, good morning, good morning, good morning. I picked out my music. I got to the station five in the morning. I was going on at nine. 
And this was May 1st, 1957. You never forget it. And I'm about, it's about 10 to 9. I'm going on at 9. And the, gen the station manager calls me in and he says, uh, okay, good luck. I said, thank you. I'm so nervous. He said, what name are you going to use? I'm going, <laughs> my name is Larry Zeiger. Now you would use that. He said, uh, uh, it's too ethnic. People won't know how to spell it. No, no. You gotta have another name. Even on Miami Beach, too yeah. ethnic. <laughs> you, you, you gotta have another name. Okay. So he had the Miami Herald open. I would later write a column for the Miami Herald. I mean, so many things. And he said, uh, there's an ad for King's Wholesale Liquors on Washington Avenue. How about Larry King? Well, that sounds good to me. I later <laughs> legally changed it, by the way. Uh -huh. Now I go into the studio. I got the record cued, Les Elgarth swinging down the lane. Da 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 dum dum dum. I'm gonna fade the music, turn on the mic, you know, do all the jolly right. things yeah. the jockeys do. I fade the music, I turn on the mic, and nothing comes out. I'm paralyzed. I'm scared. I turn the music back up. I turn the music down. Nothing comes out. No and I can look at the clock, it's three minutes after nine, and the record's nearly fading out. And I could see that I have that I I don't have I just don't have the guts to do this. I'm scared. And Marshall Simmons, the program director, the general manager, he kicked open the door of the control room, and he screamed, "This is a communications business! Damn it, communicate!" And he slammed the door. I turned on the mic. I swear to God. And I said, "Good morning. My name is Larry King. That's the first time I've ever said that." Mm -hmm. They just gave me that name. Right. And I've been sitting here, and all my life I want to be in radio. And this was my moment. And all I did was tell them the truth. This is my first day ever on the air, and I'm scared. And the general manager just kicked open the door, and he told me to communicate. And I'll tell you something, Jim. I never was nervous again in 57 years. Never nervous my first day on television. Never nervous speaking in front of an audience. And Arthur Godfrey, the great Arthur Godfrey, told me later, what you learned that day was the secret of this business, which is, there's no secret. <laughs> be yourself. Don't try to be someone else. So I, and I, whether you like me or don't like me, for 57 years, I've always been me. I can go back to that first day. Some, I, I, in fact, I was on a show once, like 10 years later, and the guy said to me, well, supposing you were walking down the hall at NBC, someone grabbed you, sat you down, and said, Tom Brokaw's sick, you're on. What'd you do? I would look at the camera and say, I was walking down the hall. <laughs> Someone just grabbed me, said, Tom broke us sick, I'm on. Now, folks, I've never anchored the news, so bear with me. Yep. See, then you take them into your circumstance. So, I, I, I want to talk about what happened between 1957 and how you got to be a national host, basically 1978. But before I do, I just got to say, our stories are incredibly similar, except for your massive success. That part we haven't gotten to yet <laughs> in my you story. Make it. Okay, so uh, I, somebody tells I was on a Bruce Williams. You remember Bruce Williams? No, uh, Bruce Williams and I worked on the same network. Yeah, so mutual broadcasting system. I, I went to a talk radio convention. Okay, and I and I said, Mr. Williams, you were in my hometown. You did this uh, snow day openings and closings. I look up to you. Tell me uh, what I should do. Am I bothering the program directors too much if I knock on their door too many times? And uh, I said, I'm afraid of burning bridges. He said, kid, what bridges do you have? <laughs> he said, you don't have any. And he said, you don't have any effing bridges. <laughs> Go keep knocking, okay? So, and then somebody tells me that they're doing programming down in Miami, local programming and television. I go down and I wait in front of the, literally in front of the studio for about a month until they come out and they say, okay, we're gonna give you a sales job. And then uh, it was Whammy TV, it was Barry Diller's USA Broadcasting. Uh, Effort. I worked on Whammy Radio. Oh, is that right? W -A Whammy in Miami. Whammy in Miami. There you go. And uh, they put me in sales, and then later I worked uh, to get myself on air. And, and, the, and as I was doing that, a program director on the radio said, nobody cares about you, kid. Uh, don't talk about yourself. Just take the callers, right? And I did the same exact thing you did. I said, all right, I'm Jenk. Let me tell you about me. <laughs> because I knew that wasn't true. I know they they want to relate to you. They want to relate to you. You had to be you. you. I had to be me. All all you yeah. can do is be true to yourself. That's what I, that's the best advice I'd ever give anyone. And never give up. If you there's always room for talent. Talent will out. There is no great broadcaster in uh, Missouri in Minnesota. And there's no great broadcaster in Mississippi who's a phenomenal talent, 
who's sending tapes out who can't get out of Mississippi. Been there for 10 years, impossible. Something's the matter. If you're good, you will be heard. There's always room. I sent out 400 tapes to get on the radio. So. I was lucky, I never had to do that. I started, started in Miami, stayed in Miami, grew with Miami, wound up on television in Miami two years later. Radio, television, newspapers, uh, they had an idea for a national radio show, started that in Miami, moved to Washington. Ted Turner called and CNN came and the rest is history. Was the first national show the overnight show in 78? So Mutual then, broadcasting system, we started on 200, we started on 28 stations and ended with about 500. So what happened between 1957 to 1978? Because in 78, then you got a national show. That's a big deal. That's where Ted no, Turner hears you. Tele, I did local radio, local television, local newspaper. I was like Mr. Miami. Uh -huh. And I was doing, I was doing a local television show, my radio show, and I was writing a column for the Miami News. And uh, Ed Little was the ran the Mutual Network, and I was on WIOD doing a show from 9 to 12 every night. Uh, I was making like uh, 50000 60000 a year. Mm -hmm. He said, why don't you do... It's not bad for the time. No, 1957 wasn't bad. It was doing three jobs. Right. And uh, he said, we'll give you $75,000. we us try to do an all-night show. Mm -hmm. Try to do national radio. Now, there's never been a national radio talk show. There was two syndicated shows, but no real network show. And the Mutual Network was part of my life as a kid. The Lone Ranger started on the Mutual Network. I mean, it was a famous network. We started, first guests were Don Shula, coach of the Dolphins, and Jackie Gleason came as a favor to me. Mm -hmm. Jackie promoted me a lot. Jackie put me on Channel 4. Jackie did a lot for me. And they were the first two guests. And I started, and I started with five hours, midnight to five. Our biggest markets were Miami, of course, the home market, and Cleveland. And then we started picking them up, and the Wall Street Journal did a big story on it, and that took off. And Ted Turner used to be a guest on my radio show and my local television show. And then in 1985, he had been on the air for five years, CNN. I'd never seen CNN. It wasn't on in Washington. They mm -hmm. weren't on in Washington. And uh, he called me up and he said, uh, I've got this girl, Sandy Freeman. She does the Freeman Report. Her husband is driving me nuts. He's her manager. Her <laughs> contract's up. This is a Tuesday. He's coming in Friday expecting a big contract. Would you want to come work for me? I'll give you 9 to 10 every night. Mm -hmm. I said, but Ted, I, I'm doing the all-night radio. Now I'm making like 200000 mm -hmm. on the all-night radio. This is now 1985. And I'm doing local television, making about 50000 And I can go to baseball games, Oriole games, and I go to hockey games. I was doing work on the hockey network. I was doing cap games. I was working, and I, I don't know CNN. And I got you take the middle of my night, or I was single, but Monday through Friday, you're going to destroy my whole... I can't go to dinner. Right. He said, I said, well, let me talk to your agent. So I called Bob Wolf, the late Bob Wolf, great Bob Wolf. He was the first sports agent. He was a friend of mine. And he said, I'll talk to Ted. And Bob came, called me up the next day, says, listen, he's got to have an answer by Thursday. This is Wednesday. Right. He says, he'll give you 200. That means you double your pay. And, and he's going to give you what, 200? 200. Okay. This is, this is 1985. He'll give you 200 and 200, two and a quarter the next year and 250 the third year. But if you're unhappy, you can opt out after a year. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want anybody to be unhappy. So I said, oh, OK. I'll give it a shot. Mm -hmm. And I flew down to Atlanta, and then Ted later told me when the husband came in to give him the goodbye, Ted said goodbye to him and out the door. Right. And uh, the first day on the air with Mario Cuomo was the guest, and uh, May f uh, it was June 1st, 1985. It was the fifth anniversary of CNN. In Georgetown in a little studio, I knew, I knew that night. First night. First night, first five minutes, we took a break and I said, this is going to work. I don't know what it is, it's going to work. Mm -hmm. Fifth and 26 years later. So at what point, okay, so you know in the first five minutes. I just don't know what it was. Right. At what point did you think, oh my God, I've become an 
international, worldwide celebrity. The way I knew it, well, I knew we were carried worldwide. I mean, Ted threw it up on the bird, and then the satellite sent us overseas. I never broadcast as if I was seen around the world. Still, I never broadcast that way. I broadcast just to the microphone or the camera. I never treated television anything more than radio with pictures. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't get all scared about what television. I was never afraid of television. Uh, and I knew we were on worldwide. We started taking calls. I'm getting calls from Bermuda and China. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when it really hit me was the Gulf War, which really got a lot of attention. But I flew to South Africa to, uh, for a group of speeches. I went to Mandela's house for lunch. It was tremendous. But I, I'm landing in South Africa. And I get off the airport, and there's a billboard, Larry King. And I go to the hotel. And I'm walking down the street, and a guy came like out of a hut, out of a hut, and he goes, Larry King live! <laughs> and then Oprah, I come back, and Oprah Winfrey said she was on a safari, a photographic safari in Africa. And she could tell that the great white hunter, the guy in charge of the safari, didn't know her. Mm -hmm. He totally didn't know who she was. So she told him, she said, I'm on television. He said, I didn't know you. So she said mm -hmm. to him, Oprah telling me this, do you know Johnny Carson? No. Mm -hmm. Do you know Walter Cronkite? No. Then the great white hunter said to her, do you know Larry King? Because <laughs> that would count. <laughs> and, he, and she said, that blew my mind. And that blew my mind. So that's when I knew. And that was, that was all, it was like a fantasy trip. I mean, the whole thing was, uh, uh, you know, and then uh, there's so many things happened in my life. But actually, I just thought, you know, you forget things, you get to be 80. I forgot that I did the first ever, I took the first ever international phone call for a guest in 1980. Mm -hmm. The Voice of America called me. I'd been doing the national radio show. And they said, we're going to do a show on short, short wave around the world, mm -hmm. except in America. It's not heard in America. And we'd like you to host it. And I signed on for a year, worked for the federal government. On Sunday afternoon, I'd go in once a month going to these studios in the Voice of America and broadcast shortwave. My first guest was the Secretary of Agriculture, Reagan administration, Secretary of Agriculture. And I said, right, let's go to calls. And the first call was from Beijing, mm -hmm. in 1980. Right. Beijing. Beijing. <laughs> and no satellites, it was phone. Mm -hmm. And I said, we call us from Beijing and the Secretary of Agriculture. What's your question? And he said, I, he learned English in the schools. And uh, his question was, what did the Secretary of Agriculture think of the new John Deere tractor? That's interesting. Well, and to he, him, that's what's relevant. Well, and, uh, but I sat there, blew my mind, the coming of technology. Mm -hmm. China is talking to America about tractors. Yeah, it's, it's... So I've lived through that, and I, I sometimes, I, I tell you the truth, though, I pinch myself every day. I can't believe everything that's happened to me because I'm still, still a Jewish kid from Brooklyn who wanted to be on the radio. Right. I just wanted to be on the radio. So now let's talk about your interviewing style. Now you know that uh, they, you know, when they describe your interviewing style, they say that you're not very aggressive and, and you let the uh, guest talk. You're aware of that. What, what's your take on that? Do you think that's I never true? I understood it. I, I was not, I'm not confrontational. No, I was not there to hammer the guest. Right. But I would, when I heard that, I would always say, give me an example of a bad question. Uh -huh. That's a bad question I asked. I've never heard a good example. Uh -huh. I asked good questions. I listened to the answers. I followed up. I didn't scream at guests. I never counted me as more. A lot of talk show hosts, the guest is a prop mm -hmm. for them. Guess is there to serve their needs. Mm -hmm. I never felt that way. I always felt that, the, and Paul Newman said to me once, he says, you know, you're going to be there the next night. Mm -hmm. So what do, what do you need? Do I need to flaunt my desires and scream? I don't need that. If you ask good questions, and the simplest questions are the best. And I used to ask questions, because I never thought about a question, I never planned a question, I never had questions written, ever. Mm -hmm. But I would ask questions that just, and people say to me, wow. You know, I, I'll give you a simple, I, I'll remember one thing just years. Interviewing a pilot. When you're going down the runway, you know it's going to take off? Mm -hmm. 
Paul said, they've been asked that. No one ever asked me that. Mm -hmm. Is it going to take off? I asked bus drivers when I was a kid, why do you want to drive a bus? I had asked doctors, why do they choose that specialty? What's it like in an operating room? What, what's it like when you open somebody up? What is, what is that like? Are you in command? What is, the, what is the thriller? What's it like in war? For example, we had the war, first Gulf War, and I would watch other stations, and the host would sometimes, today they did this and pontificate. My first question was always the same. Whether it was a reporter, a general, an observer, what happened? Mm -hmm. Now, simplicity worked for me. So if that was a style, I guess it was a style. If I could teach it, I don't know if I could teach it. But I tell you this, I never ask questions over two sentences long. Mm -hmm. I watch some of these presidential press conferences, they're showing off. They're showing off. For what end? You got the President of the United States. Right. I remember interviewing Bill Clinton in the White House, and we were looking out the window, and I, I said, well, what do you think about when you, you look out the window? What do you think about? Mm -hmm. And he said, I, I wish I could be out there. There are well, moments. That's interesting. I wouldn't have expected that. There are moments I'd like right. to. But that's a good question. So I would come at the angle from that. Why? You know, and someone said, well, what if you were interviewing Osama bin Laden? Right? Mm -hmm. Well, the worst question to ask Osama bin Laden would be, first question, why'd you bomb that building? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So he might go off into some, or get defensive, or ask. My first question would have been, you came from one of the richest families in Saudi Arabia. Why'd you leave? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, then I'm going to learn more. When I get around to 9-11, I'm going to come from what led this man, rich man, to live in caves, to come around to that. Because my friend Herbie Cohen, the great negotiator, told me, and I learned, no evil person, no evil person, looks in a mirror and says, I'm evil. Yeah. Right? I talk no. about that Hitler all the time. Hitler didn't think yeah. he did anything wrong. He combed his hair, <laughs> I'm going to have another great day. Right? <laughs> so if I approach him that you're wrong, right. wonderful. Might make exciting television, you don't learn anything. Mm -hmm. But if I approach him as, why, what took you to this? Why do you think this way? So, I want the audience to make its conclusion. So that's all, that's my style. I, I, I totally understand. Let me take just one last step further then. Because I, I think you come at it from a, a genuine curiosity, Correct. and you ask people uh, what you what's on top of your mind. curious. What do you think about the criticism of the questions that you don't ask? So, so for example, uh, if President Obama is sitting across from you, first thing I'd want to ask is, "What did you mean by change?" Right? And maybe that's a question you ask as well, right? Because no. he. Yeah, later. Yeah, later. My first right. question would be, and I've interviewed him, so it was the first question. Right. Uh, what surprised you the most? Mm -hmm. Right. See, now, that's, interesting. What, what, that's leading to other questions. When you say the question I wouldn't ask, what, what wouldn't I ask? So, it, if an example critics might give is specifics. So, for example, on, on the drone strikes, he does signature drone strikes where personality strikes are where you know who you're targeting. Signatures, you don't know who you're targeting. It's based on uh, things like cell phones and et cetera. So, they might say, hey, you should be tougher on him. And you should ask him, hey, why are you killing people you don't even know who you're the killing? Tough, yeah, you, you, could ask, but you could ask that a different way. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's it like when you order that? Mm -hmm. What do you think about? See, okay. now you could say, are you killing people like that? The same way, coming around it that way, what do I get him more relaxed mm -hmm. and more honest? So you, how do you deal with that? Fantastic dilemma. See, what people don't understand, he, none of us have been president, mm -hmm. so we've never had to face this. Here's a dilemma. I might pose a hypothetical question. You learn absolutely perfect information that that guy is going to commit an act that will harm this country. He has no, no, no criminal background, no, but you're convinced. The top information you have He's an American citizen in a foreign country. Did you kill him? Yeah. Well, now, that would get your response. Now, I mean, that's Obama, a better question be yes. than what do you. <laughs> well, he wouldn't just say yes. Mm -hmm. He'd have to think about it. Right. 
we had bona fide information on weapons of mass destruction. Weapon mass destruction turned out to be wrong. Mm -hmm. What if you're wrong? Mm -hmm. What if you're wrong? What's it like to send people to war? Right. The, I'm, so I'm come. It's just the style. Now you may choose to say, "Why could you do that? How could you drone someone?" Fine, that mm -hmm. works for you. Right. you know, Mike Wallace and I really got along. I love Mike Wallace, and he was he did a piece on me on 60 Minutes. That's a tra he really was complimentary and everything. We just worked differently. Mike liked that. Mike said, "I was so good to you, I'm going to kill the next three people I do." <laughs> but that was his style. We all have a style. You have right. to do what you're comfortable with. Right. If you do something you're not comfortable with, I would have been uncomfortable pointing a finger mm -hmm. at a president of the United States. Not right. would have been not in my comfort zone. I understand perfectly. All right, last question. The internet is wondering. You had this famous interview with Jerry Seinfeld, uh, and uh, Seinfeld gets mad at you because he said you. He said, later said he wasn't mad, but he was mad. So that's what I was going to ask you. Was he actually mad? I think so. We were on uh, Conan the next night together as guests, and he said he wasn't mad. Um, what happened was, I don't. What I let me give you my habit. I watch sports. I'm a mm. sports nut. Okay. Mm. So I've learned to appreciate Seinfeld later. Mm. I watch his reruns now, and I think it's the, maybe the best show ever on television. Mm. Arguably the best show ever on television. Maybe Larry King Live. No, no, maybe. I'm talking for comedy, <laughs> yeah. but in his time, the best. However, I never watched Seinfeld much. Mm -hmm. So I knew it went off at the end of nine years. So I asked to be, why'd you leave? I right. didn't know that. I, I didn't know that. I thought he was dropped. What was it like when the show, mm -hmm. when, he, when he took it off? Right. I didn't know that he took it off. Right. But that was, I should have known that. But, but I was stupid. I should have known, hey, you, can be, you can't know everything. Right. Okay, so that mystery is solved. Uh, I, I, I lied. Once, last question about what you're going to do next. Uh, next. You're on, you're I'm on 80 or. 80 years old. I'm doing 14 <laughs> things. I'm doing a radio thing in the morning. <laughs> Dropping in. I'm on well, AARP. Is, what do you want me to do? No, but that's what I'm saying. Like, as I hear the story, you're doing about five jobs a year on any given year. You know, that's you're I'm doing. doing a weekly, a monthly show for the Dodgers New Network. See, of course you are. LA See? Sportsnet. Right. So, are you ever going to stop? No, you're just going to keep 90, 100, doesn't matter. You're still going to be doing five jobs. I think my next jobs. thing is to be a professional bungee jumper. <laughs> I wouldn't put it past you. <laughs> <laughs> my, own, my hope next thing is to live. You know what I mean? I, wanna, I, like, to keep in, I like to keep healthy. And are come, you, when you wake up in the morning, are you super happy? You're like, I'm Larry King. I, no, I don't say I'm Larry King. I open my eyes and say, thanks. I didn't deserve who, who gave me the, the right to wake up? But when I go to sleep at night, I worry about dying. My biggest fear is I don't want to die. I want to live forever. That's fair. Someone said, what would be the last question you would like to ask of the last guest you will ever interview? And my question would be, what is it like to be interviewed by the oldest man that ever lived? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Larry King, great, thank man. you so much for thank joining you. us on The Young Turks. My Appreciate pleasure. It.